participants, uh, um, I will ask all of you when you consider opportunity for jumping in, all of us. Um, what do you think, Nikhil, uh, Maria Francesca, Alex? Yeah, that's Can good. we start now? Let's yes, I think yeah. we should start. Okay, uh, Fernando, do you have any question before we go? The only on? question is, can you make me a co-host so that I can share my screen when the time is ready? Pelayo, uh, Harris, can you take care of that? You'll be able to share your screen as a panelist. Thank you, Harris. No problem. Okay, I have the, so can I, can I go now? Yes, we're live on YouTube. All right. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the fifth edition of the Learning Center of the High Level Political Forum 2020 for UNITAR, New York Office, and for a colleague from the Department of Economic and Social Affairs. It's a real pleasure to welcome you in these difficult uh, times. We will have uh, 10 sessions, all of them virtually during the Learning Center. We adapt our platform to deliver these uh, uh, learning sessions uh, in order to reach out uh, uh, in a virtual mode, all of you, and to share our knowledge or expertise or, um, uh, or exchange of, uh, of ideas and how to implement the sustainable development goals in COVID-19 era. It's, uh, it's a very complicated uh, time. The Learning Center started in 2016 and I am very, uh, uh, Proud to say it has been in there since the beginning with our colleague from UNDESA with uh, LOTA. And then uh, we have an overall of 500 participants during the first uh, session uh, for the 10 sessions that we delivered during the Learning Center. Just today, uh, we are hitting about 500, 600 participants just in the inaugural session. So uh, we must be doing something uh, well, and I am very pleased with that. Um, I wanted to say also that during the, uh, this year, uh, we celebrated the 75th anniversary of the uh, United Nations. Um, the United Nations born after a very um, heavy conflict and crisis. Uh, I guess the founder fathers will never imagine that we're going to celebrate the 75th anniversary also in another global uh, crisis. Uh, may I say that uh, for us and for generations to come, at least we have the United Nations. And the Sustainable Development Goals, this agenda, has uh, become the best tool that we have to combat this pandemic and also to curb the uh, dear implications that, uh, that they have. So we have to celebrate the United Nations and we have to participate. And that's why we wanted to give a sense of normality during the high level political forum, having the learning center guys, we normally do uh, every year. Uh, we have a full uh, program uh, today. Uh, we have the executive director of UNITAR, Mr. Nikhil Set, assistant secretary general. We also have Ms. Uh, Maria uh, Francesca Espolitano, uh, director of uh, policy and coordination and interagency affair of the Department of Economic and Social Affairs. Um, we have a well-known professor for Harvard University, Mr. Fernando Reimers. We have the director of the Sustainable Development Division of UNDESA, Mr. Alex Trepelkov, among us. And um, I am 100% sure that this will going to be a very rich uh, uh, exchange and, and sharing knowledge with you. We also uh, have a panel that will be uh, uh, coordinated, and I will ask uh, our dear friend Lota uh, Tiantinen to uh, guide us through this uh, panel. Uh, and Mr. Alex Trabejol will give us uh, some uh, closing uh, remarks at, at the end. So with this, I will um, thank you all the panelists for being with us today, uh, for sharing their time, their knowledge with our uh, participants. And I will yield to floor to our spe uh, speaker the executive director of uh, UNITAR, Mr. Uh, Nikhil Seth, uh, who is uh, in Geneva now. Uh, Nikhil, uh, welcome, and I yield the floor to you. Thank you, Marco, and a very warm welcome to all of you from all over the world to the first virtual training center. 
It is a special pleasure for me to be collaborating again with my older family from UNDESA and its Division for Sustainable Development. And this is the fifth edition of the Training Center, which now provides an expanded space for learning and knowledge sharing to participants, not only at the HLPF, but all over the world. It has been a great success, the Learning Center, and it's a reflection of the very fruitful partnership that we've had in, from the Institute of Training and Research and the Department of Economic and Social Affairs. A special thank you to you, to Marco Suazo and his team at the New York office who have spearheaded this learning center jointly with DESA and have provided learning opportunities during each of the previous high-level political forum. I was wondering what I should say at the opening and such a crucial inflection point in human history. And I thought I would focus my comments on three issues. First, on how the pandemic has affected the implementation of the SDGs. And all of you will remember the euphoria when we had in September of 2015 to loud applause in the General Assembly Hall adopted the SDGs. Then secondly, of the impact of the COVID-19 crisis on learning. And of course, we have a wonderful keynote speaker who will talk much more about this. And finally, about setting our incentives for a better recovery, a greener recovery. The COVID-19 pandemic has severely impacted all the SDGs, and it has specially revealed a number of vulnerabilities in our healthcare systems and beyond. It has exacerbated inequalities. It has affected some population groups more than others people with non-communicable diseases and elderly persons facing higher mortality risks, households with low income and those in overcrowded slums facing faster community transmission rates. Persons working in the informal sector have lost jobs and their livelihoods. The COVID-19 crisis has dealt a severe blow to the efforts to alleviate extreme poverty, one of the most noble goals of the SDGs. The World Bank is estimating that 71 million people will be pushed as a result of this crisis into extreme poverty. We also expect 1.6 billion informal sector workers to lose their livelihoods. Global growth is projected to contract by about 5% in 2020, worse than during the global financial crisis. A number of countries face falling fiscal revenues. The World Trade Organization is warning that the downturn in trade may be particularly severe for least, development, least developed countries, as many of them heavily depend on export earnings from one or few commodity exports and face a fall in remittances from the diasporas abroad. On the somewhat positive side, there has been some talk that GHG emissions will drop by between four to 7% in 2020, but this is going to be only a temporary fall and will only be a blip in the long-term trajectory of greenhouse gas emissions and uh, which are breaking new record levels. On other environmental issues, we have seen waste generation on the rise, both organic and non-organic from hospitals, but also PPEs as they are called, such as disposal of masks and gloves, as well as suspension of recycling measures and other environmental regulations in a number of places. UNITAR publishes annually a global e-waste monitor and which has reflected a record generation of 53.6 million tons of electronic waste in 2019. The, the COVID crisis has caused a major interruption to the delivery of education across the globe. According to UNESCO, nationwide school closures were impacting over 90% of the world's children and students. Access to resources and technologies at home have the potential to exacerbate existing inequalities between nations and individual students. Some of these trends, I'm only talking a few of these trends, substantiate the core message that we had developed and presented in the 2030 agenda. First, reach the most vulnerable first. 
Second, approach issues in an integrated way. Third, strengthen partnerships. Fourth, reinforce solidarity, compassion, and caring. On online learning, there have been strong developments related to adult learning. Schools and universities have had to urgently adapt to teaching online classes, and the providers of online courses targeting adults have seen a sharp increase in demand. At UNITAR, we have a very uh, a platform which we are very proud of. It's called UN Climate Change Learn. And we saw a massive increase in both registrations, but also course completion. 75,000 learners registered for this the UN Climate Change Learn course during the first six months of 2020. And this was more than during the whole last of last year. 29,000 learners have completed the course this year, almost as many as the previous 12 months. We have a UN SDG Learn Gateway, which offers access to SDG related courses of UN agencies and other partners, which has acquired more than 37,000 new users for mid-April. So just in two months, we have over 37,000 new users. And the registrations for the UN SDG related online courses have doubled during the lockdown. We've also had to convert some of our traditional face-to-face -face activities into online learning. And first results show that for some of the courses, online learning may be a better alternative. One of the novelties is a surge in webinars compared to online sessions that have the advantage of increasing the outreach of your learning events. So many of us have our views on how online learning and virtual classrooms compare with face-to-face -face learning, but as far as democratization of knowledge, democratization of learning, affordability of platforms such as this show that the potential of reaching people in the millions and we have to reach people in the millions if we want to see change in this world uh, will be facilitated, uh, which may be uh, positive in a sense of this faster acceleration into on online platforms. It was happening earlier, but now it's been accelerated to something we'd not even imagined. The UNITAR New York office, the Hiroshima office, we've all adapted to, to delivering trainings virtually. And now we're no longer constrained by the capacity of physical meeting rooms and the constant struggle to get a room in New York, especially during the high level political forum and the General Assembly, we are able to host far more people in a virtual format. Uh, there are several vectors, but which will define the uptake of online learning. And I know Professor Raina will be he, he talk much more about this, but to my mind in these months where we have tr uh, transitioned to almost 100% online learning. First, the question comes to mind, will online learning be able to leverage cognitive science and pedagogy to ensure quality learning accounting for various learners and their needs? We are still in a pioneering stage. Second, will we be able to overcome the digital divide and meet the challenges of ensuring internet connectivity for all so that every person could reap the benefits of online learning? Many of our potential learners are in internet unstable environments. How do we get to them? That remains a big challenge. Will it lead to further improvements and innovations in digital technologies, making online learning even easier in a variety of environments? Will micro learning hold its promise in reaching out to those who have limited time? Will free online learning lead to higher completion rates? Will we be able to leverage online learning effectively to change mindsets, to strengthen knowledge, and build the skills for attaining the SDGs. Finally, on the green recovery, I wanted to say, uh, I reflect on looking ahead and the need to rebuild the global economy following the massive disruption caused by this pandemic. The present situation is an opportunity to transform our economies and lifestyles to promote sustainable development and a life of dignity for all. The Secretary General of the United Nations has talked about this often. So many thinkers, philosophers, practitioners, policymakers have been talking about this. The world is going to be investing over $20 trillion in the next 18 months. 
And uh, the question is, will these recovery packages support policies that generate green jobs, encourage investments in sustainable sectors, including renewable energy, in smart housing, in green public procurement, in public transport and innovation, and create incentives for businesses to go green? A number of countries have demonstrated efforts to put sustainability at the center of their recovery by targeting energy and transportation sectors, green startups and green industrial zones. Germany, the Republic of Korea, and many countries in the EU have been pioneers in this kind of expenditures. Urban farming has emerged in some cities as a response to disruptions in global food systems. Bangkok, Paris, Singapore plan to increase local food supply in urban areas from 10 to 30% by 2030. Many consumers have turned to local and organic producers and some plan to keep up after the lockdown. Making sectors with high potential for decent work, such as textile industry cleaner and more sustainable is another example of working towards both social and environmental objectives. It is also important that long-term policy measures we develop in public health and other areas are well designed and contribute to our efforts to protect the planet. This year, we are celebrating the fifth anniversary of the adoption of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. We are celebrating the 75th anniversary of the founding of the United Nations. It is time for the international community to recommit and refocus on working to achieve the principles and the goals in the UN Charter and in the Sustainable Development Goals. The Sustainable Development Goals are a clear guiding map which enjoy a groundswell of political support. Let us not fritter away this opportunity. Of course, our preoccupation is going to be with infectious diseases, but let's not get diverted from the long-term goals of ending poverty, reducing inequalities, of providing a sustainable pathway for a future, for a sustainable a future for all of humankind. And I thank you for your attention and wish you all a successful learning sessions. We have kept the whole week busy for you with a large number of learning related activity. And I hope these are a success. And thank you, Francesca. And thank you all who are participating in making this a success. Thank you. Marco, you are muted. I'm sorry. Uh, I was uh, thanking you, um, Activity Director, for just these inspiring words and for putting ahead some uh, some uh, some thought about what we can lead to the discussions. It's a pleasure now to welcome Maria Francesca Espa Polizano from the. Uh, Assistant Secretary General for Policy Coordinator, and also um, will produce some uh, key remarks uh, to us. Uh, she also is the uh, Interagency Affairs Coordinator for the United Nations Department of Economic and Social uh, Affairs. Uh, Maria Francesca, I yield to you uh, for your presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Marco, and uh, thank you, Nikhil. And good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you who are connected. Thank you for being with us today. It is a pleasure for me to participate in the opening of this year's edition of the SDG Learning, Training, and pra Practice Sessions, organized in connection with the 2020 session of the UN High Level Political Forum on Sustainable Development. Let me begin by thanking UNITA for the long-term partnership and great collaboration with DESA in organizing the program of the workshop sessions and for hosting them virtually on your platform in light of the ongoing uh, pandemic that prevents us from being together in person. UNITA is a close partner of DESA in several other projects, including two which we will launch today. It, uh, it's my pleasure also to um, express our uh, uh, DESA appreciation to the numerous partner organizations that will be leading the different learning sessions 
throughout the week and sharing their expertise with the stakeholders all over the world. We have an impressive list of institutions from different sectors who have demonstrated the, the highest level of flexibility, not only in working in partnership to prepare the workshop, but also in adjusting the content to the virtual format we have. The high number of registrations for this year's sessions is an encouraging sign indeed of the ongoing commitment of the global community to the implementation of SDGs. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the assessments of the impact of COVID-19 on the SDGs are alarming, as Nikhil very well uh, already illustrated. The reports and other analytical products prepared by DESA show that if responses to combating the virus are simply ad hoc, or are underfunded or without a view to the long-term goals, decades of progress are at jeopardy of being reversed. As countries are stemming the impacts of the virus on their populations and begin to move towards recovery, we need coherent and comprehensive actions that can place the world on a robust trajectory towards achieving sustainable development in line with the 2030 Agenda and the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. In this regard, the global multilateral system can be pivotal in supporting three strategic uh, priorities during the response and recovery. Let me go through briefly what we mean. Uh, one, maintaining progress already made towards eradicating these, uh, the deprivations. It is critical that we support those at immediate risk of poverty, hunger or disease, while facilitating their safe return to work and education and their access to healthcare. Two, accelerating the universal provision of quality essential services to all, such as quality healthcare, indeed, the education, water and sanitation, clean energy, and internet, which is, um, if accessible, as Nikhil uh, said, uh, a way to help secure well being, develop resilience, and combat inequalities. And third, we need to be acting to reversing the degradation of nature, including reducing greenhouse uh, gas emissions, land degradation, and biodiversity loss. So education. Education is one of the essential services that must be universally accessible. Estimates indicate that school closures due to COVID have affected 90% of students around the world, or 1.6 billion youth. Prolonged school closures risk exacerbating educational and income inequalities around the world for years to come. More than ever, we need to invest in education, learning, and knowledge exchange, including for the poorest and most vulnerable populations. Ladies and gentlemen, I now have the pleasure to officially launch two concrete outcomes of UNDESA's partnership with UNITAR. Since 2016, our organizations have offered, as you heard, an annual online course on strengthening stakeholders' engagement for the implementation and review of the 2030 Agenda. While the main target of this online course has been to train government officials, I'm pleased that the course has been adapted now into a massive open online course, a so-called MOOC, which was offered for the first time in late 2019. Today, we are pleased to launch the 2020 edition of this online course, which is open to all interested stakeholders and is offered free of charge. Registration opens today and the course will be delivered between September and December 2020. The link for more information is shown on the slide you see. Secondly, together with UNITAR, 
we have also adapted the content of the online course into a publication, which we are also pleased to launch today. The document is currently available online in English with Spanish and French versions being made available shortly. Strengthening uh, the engagement of stakeholders will be critical if we are serious about delivering on the decade of action for the SDGs. We count on your support to promote this material as much as possible. Please do promote it, share it with everybody. So ladies and gentlemen, my final message is about the need for all of us to increase our ambition and to commit to concrete action that accelerate the implementation of the SDGs. I want to take this opportunity to invite all of you to register and share information on another platform about uh, your SDG acceleration actions using the global platform set up by DESA. So far, we have more than 150 SDG acceleration actions registered by governments and stakeholders around the world. You see on the screen the platform. By accelerating action on SDG implementation, we can avert the worst outcomes of the pandemic and ensure a fairer, more sustainable world for everyone. Thank you very much for your attention. I wish you all great learning opportunities. Over. Thank you. Thank you, Francesca, for that very clear and informative uh, content of what you have conveyed to all of us. It is now my great pleasure to introduce today's keynote speaker. Professor Fernando Reimers is a Ford Foundation Professor of Practice in International Education and the Faculty Director for International Education Policy at the Harvard University Graduate School of Education. Professor Reimers studies and teaches about innovative education policies and programs that help students develop competencies necessary for civic participation, work and life in the 21st century. He also works in the area of global citizenship education and is uh, and how to align educational policies for the achievement of the SDGs. Uh, we had uh, difficulty, Professor, in bringing in the concept of good global citizenship into the 2030 agenda, but it does now appear a couple of times in the front portion. Uh, and I'm very proud of the fact that we have put the concept of good global citizenship there. Uh, and Professor Ramos also teaches a graduate course that examines the core global education challenges and the role of policy analysis in addressing them and a course on educational innovation that supports social entrepreneurs in generating and scaling up programs that enhance the relevance of education to the challenges of our times. Uh, Professor, as you will tell us about the kind of innovation, especially in this digital era, we'd like to know what works and what does not work in this world of virtual classrooms and digital education. But over to you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nikhil, for this uh, kind introduction and to Ambassador Suazo for the, the invitation to address you this morning. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to be in this conversation at this critical time in the history of humanity when 11.6 million people have been infected and more than half a million have lost their lives. And this is not over. This is clearly a global calamity that is disrupting uh, many spheres of life and, and it's not over. But I take our meeting as a sign of hope. Uh, hope not based on the denial of the gravity of this crisis, but hope based on the commitment that each one of us will do what is within our power to help our fellow humans on this planet see a pathway from this critical time that we find ourselves to a world that is better after this pandemic. Not that is a world that as we left it before the pandemic, but to committing to actually building a renaissance. Much has happened in Florence after the terrible pandemic of the 14th century. And so it is uh, along those lines that my remarks this morning are going to address how it is that our education response during and after the pandemic can help us build a renaissance. I'm going to share my screen now to share with you 
uh, some slides that I have prepared uh, this morning. Can you see my screen at this moment? Yes. Good. So five years ago, the General Assembly of the UN approved a most ambitious and inclusive vision of a world a world in which every human belong and a world in which we related to the environment uh, in ways that were sustainable. If you look at the particular target of education, uh, it couldn't get better than that. This was an invitation not only to include every child in schools, but to make sure that that inclusion translated into the development of competencies that help us address the most pressing challenges advance human rights, advance gender equality, promote a culture of peace and nonviolence, global citizenship, and understand cultural diversity as the strength and as the opportunity that it is. Clearly, those goals built squarely on this most wonderful creation of humanity, Article 26 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which I outline in section two, a vision of what is it that we're trying to do when we educate every child to promote understanding, tolerance, and friendship among all nations, racial and religious groups, and further the activities of the UN for the maintenance of peace. In many ways, it's good to remember that that creation, the Universal Declaration, happened in the aftermath of a terrible calamity, World War II. In fact, in 1942, a group of education leaders met in the middle of World War II, met in, the, in, in Britain, to imagine what eventually would become UNESCO. So this is our 1942 moment. This is our moment to imagine what kind of an education system do we need to build? What kind of a renaissance do we need so we can actually achieve that inclusive and sustainable vision achieving the SDGs? So this is the world as we know it. Coronavirus has disrupted not only health, but economic activity, opportunities for civic political participation. And it is causing all kinds of possible disruptions. So it is understandable that some people may see this moment as a big hole in the development agenda, as development in reverse, as the moment when we abandoned all those aspirations. And that I think would be very misguided. For the last three months, I have been working with colleagues in the OECD, the World Bank and the Organization 100 studying the kinds of education responses to the COVID pandemic that have been generated and trying to identify and spotlight bright spots. And we have done three very simple things. We have conducted two surveys administered in about a hundred countries, one three months ago and one half a month ago, asking the question of what impact has the pandemic had on education and what are you doing about it? And we're also conducting case studies of innovative responses, particularly responses to sustain educational opportunity of marginalized populations. What I have learned from that research are six lessons that I think are very important to this moment. The first one, the normalization of the importance of education. In the last major pandemic, only a century ago, I can assure you that education was not only one of the top three priorities, it was not one of the top three. At that moment, only 30% of the world population went to school and people were not thinking about schools. The fact that today we are, we are thinking about educational inclusion at a moment when we are worrying about sustaining life and health is a great achievement. It's a reminder of the power of these covenants of the inclusion of education as a right in the Universal Declaration that has normalized the notion that this is a basic human right. The second thing that I have learned from this research is the great professionalism of educators around the world, of people working in all kinds of conditions, often in very dire circumstances, who understand that this is not a job, but it's a life mission. And that this mission has caused them to go to extraordinary lengths to do what is within their power to sustain educational opportunity. This is perhaps the most valuable lesson that students are learning, that in the midst of this tragedy, People are going above and beyond to sustain this human right. This is the pathway on which the hope can be sustained that not only will there, the sun rise again after this pandemic, but we may actually be able to build a renaissance. 
This research is also showing that there is already an innovation ecosystem in all kinds of societies. There is great capacity for innovation among teachers. There are very good things happening as a result of partnerships between organizations in civil society and governments. I am at the moment studying partnerships built by 25 universities around the world, mostly in the developing world, who have taken it as their mission to sustain educational opportunity in partnership with K through 12, school, uh, K through 12 schools. And I believe this is a, an astonishing, a wonderful and inspiring level of innovation that is happening around the world. And the reason I'm studying it is because I think spotlighting that can not only help us learn about innovation, it can inspire others. It can I imagine if the 28,000 universities around the world adopted it as their mission to partner with K through 12 schools to help them find ways of educational opportunity. Together, those universities have more institutional capacity than any institution that we can imagine, than the entire UN system uh, put together. So the means are within reach for us to build this renaissance that we need in education. I have also learned from this research that schools and education systems can learn quickly, that many of these systems have on very short notice created alternative means of education delivery imperfect as they are, learn from experience and make them better. We've also seen great potential of technology not only to deliver education, and I'm not referring only to online technology, I'm referring to WhatsApp, I'm referring to television, I'm referring to radio, not only to deliver education, but also to permit new forms of management and of government. And lastly, I have seen that this moment has caused many to, the, to very generously open up uh, and participate in forms of collaboration that I just hadn't seen before. So these are all good news. This is a spirit that I hope can be maintained. If we do, we will be able to build Florence as the Medici's were able to after the pandemic in the middle of this tragedy. But there are, of course, important questions. What are students learning? And I'm not just referring what are they learning uh, about their basics. Is what they're learning relevant to the world that this pandemic is causing? is what they're learning align with the SDGs and how are education systems changing? Are they becoming more innovative, more agile, more capable of addressing the needs of the future or are they retrenching into a mode of making decisions in a top-down fashion that will make it difficult for them uh, to sustain a relevant education in the future? And I think those are important questions. And what I want to suggest today is that going back to the SDGs as the North Star to drive educational and system improvement is the way to make sure we move forward and not that we allow development in reverse. And I'm gonna share with you um, four products, the result of work with my collaborators that are entirely about aligning curriculum and education systems with the SDGs. This is work that was done uh, before the pandemic, but I believe it is relevant for this moment and for this moment going forward as education systems as schools have to find alternative ways of delivery. In fact, they're engaging in a form of design thinking where it is fundamental that they ask not only how can we reach the kids, how can we make sure they learn, but that they ask the most important question of what should they learn? And in answering that question, I believe the SDGs continue to provide an inspiring, a powerful vision to make education relevant in this moment and beyond. Why is it important? Because we have evidence that the education systems we have built, terrific as they were in so many ways, were not doing a very good job in providing an education that was relevant. These are results from the last administration of both the PISA and the TALI studies conducted by the OECD. And what they show is that a very, when students, for example, were asked, are you satisfied with your life? A very high percentage of them were not. Um, you look, for example, in the US, only 60% of the students were not satisfied with their lives. What a waste, what a failure for an education system, for a society to have people in their prime of their lives at the age of 15, to have two in five of them unhappy with their lives. When students were asked, have you been bullied in school? A very high percentage of students around the world are bullied in school. What a tragedy that this institution that was built to advance peace becomes a place in which violence is perpetrated against students, in which the main lessons that students experience is that they can be the victims of violence by their fellow students. 
When students are asked, does your life have clear meaning or purpose? Only about 80% of them in some countries, less in others. Don't see the point. In the UK, it's only three in five students who see a point for their lives. What a failure of our educational institutions that do not help people at the age of 15 understand what the purpose of their life is. And in many ways, this is absolutely related to how it is that teachers teach and engage their students. The Thales survey, which asks teachers to report on the ways in which they teach, identifies that most teachers are much better at teacher-centered instruction, at cultivating low order cognitive skills than they are at engaging their students with challenging activities, with activities that allow them the opportunity to collaborate with activities that help them understand the connection between what happens in school and the real world. So most teachers summarize recently learned content. Most teachers set goals at the beginning of instruction. Most teachers explain to their students what they expect them to learn. Most teachers explain how something new is related to something they've taught in the past. But very few teachers provide their students problems for which there is no obvious solution. And what could be more relevant to prepare students for a world that is volatile and uncertain than to engage them with complex tasks of this sort? Very few teachers provide their students tasks that require them to think critically. Very few teachers have their students work in small groups to solve a problem. Very few teachers provide their students the opportunity to decide on their own how to solve a problem. Very few teachers provide their students a challenge that requires at least a week to complete. And this pandemic and the SDGs are an opportunity to help us re-examine the entirety of educational enterprise, not to create a new silo, not to provide students a set of lessons that help them parrot the SDGs, but to help teachers and parents and principals ask, why do we educate? How do we make sure that the capacities that our students gain actually help us build a world without poverty? Help us students understand that goal and why it matters, have the skills to advance it and have the commitment to advance it. I just finished a book talking about education and addressing education and climate change. And among the much, it'll be published in a few months. months. And among the most interesting research that I read in writing that book is research that shows that knowledge of the risks of climate change is insufficient to help people behave in ways that would make any difference. In fact, knowledge alone helps students understand the complexity and drown in the complexity and alienates them from any activity. It leads many of them to a kind of fatality, saying the world will end in a few generations and there's nothing I can do about that. But knowledge with hope causes people to act in ways that make a difference. And hope is built when students engage in experiences in the schools that help them see a pathway between their behaviors, the kinds of things they can do as students and the problems they're understanding. And this is the opportunity the SDGs provide every teacher, not only after the pandemic, not only when schools are normally functioning now, as teams are designing, how do we deliver an alternative way of education for the duration of this pandemic? I believe the SDGs provide us an invitation to ask, what are the skills that students need to gain so they understand what a world without poverty means, so they have the skills to advance it, and so they have the hope and the commitment to do what is within their reach to do that. And the three curricula that I'm presenting here, which are open source materials I have posted online, the links are an example of how to do that. I have developed those curricula uh, since the SDGs were published and they have been adopted by thousands of schools and networks of schools around the world. And I'm going to very briefly describe what they do. The first one of them, the world course, is a curriculum aligned with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and with the SDGs. In fact, I developed that uh, initially aligned with the Millennium Development Goals and then modified them as the SDGs were adopted. And the organizing principles are very simple. Begin with the end in mind, create projects that allow students to engage actively over an extended period of time, collaborating with their peers. This is doable, perhaps even more so now, that students cannot come to school. If there is one thing this pandemic has taught many teachers is the power of the autonomy of their students, of giving students more autonomy, more freedom, of suspending our belief in the power of the traditional ways in which we have taught them, of building alternative ways of education where students need to be by necessity more on the driver's seat of their own learning and where they can learn from one another using various ways to connect 
than they have in the past. It's a curriculum based on active learning, emphasizing the breadth of skills, which is essential, um, that engages students in year-long projects that has interdisciplinary new units where new content and knowledge is developed, where the goal is as much to foster agency, the ability and the desire to make a difference, initiative and leadership, as it, each, as it is to convey content to students. The organizing principles are to learn from what works as a way to build that hope, to scaffold that hope, to develop an innovative and entrepreneurial spirit, to engage parents and community members as resources. If there is a silver lining of this pandemic is that throughout the world, many parents are now much more aware of how it is that students are learning and what it is that they're learning than they've ever been. And that is a good thing because parents and community members can be a great resource uh, and a great partner to teachers. And I think all of us educators should approach parents in a great spirit of humility, understanding what they have to offer as a resource that it, that it is for the education of their, of their children. The global challenges, SDGs and human rights are the focus. There are many connections between global and local. Global citizenship education is nothing but the civic education of the 21st century. Because in a world that is highly interdependent, there is no way to understand local affairs or to participate in them if we cannot at the same time understand the connection, how deeply intertwined those local affairs are with affairs that are global. The idea of this curriculum is to engage students with complex issues, help them go from the personal and immediate to more complex. So what this curriculum does is to name the end goal, is to engage a group of teachers in defining what are these learning outcomes, inter intercultural competency, knowledge and skills, and for each one of them to mention in great granular detail, how will we be able to know if we have succeeded? So for interpersonal, identify constructs such as recognize and weigh diverse cultural perspectives, understand their own identity and the identities of others, work productively in intercultural teams, be able to demonstrate empathy towards others from different origins, understand and appreciate cultural variation. For intrapersonal, curiosity about global affairs, um, understand cultural prejudice. Uh, for ethics, understand to have the capacity to interact with others from different cultural backgrounds, understand the role of trust in maintaining global institutions, appreciate the ethical frameworks that exist in diverse religious systems, realize the common values and common humanity across civilizational streams, commitment to the basic equality of all people. In a nutshell, a series of capacities that produce the kind of cosmopolitan that the Declaration of Human Rights aspired when it included education as a universal right. I realize this runs around, uh, against the current stream of national xenophobic populist intolerant uh, movements in many places around the world, which threaten, threaten the stability of a, a, a world which can live in peace. But precisely for that reason, there is even greater urgency in advancing an anti-racist, a multicultural, a human rights, a globally oriented curriculum everywhere, especially in the places that are uh, even more subject to these forms of, of uh, prejudice, xenophobic education. So of course there is knowledge in a variety of domains that students must gain. And this is going to require certainly not only uh, better high quality curriculum, but investments in teacher professional development. I will now talk about how do we make this happen in practice? Essentially what this protocol does is it makes it possible to test the two hypotheses that underlie any curriculum. That if we teach A, our students will learn B. And if our students learn B, C will happen in the world. It is only the most reflective educators who ever test those hypotheses and very seldom in a public way. And what this tool does is to provide a language, an instrument, a protocol that makes it possible for those hypotheses to be tested in a way that is visible and that can help make this visible knowledge, professional knowledge. This curriculum simplified what I have just described and contains essentially an explanation of how do we go from the SDGs to developing curriculum. And this tool has been translated and published as an open resource in seven different languages. Ambassador Suazo will be able to provide you the links to those resources. It also contains a protocol to engage a group of teachers in a design thinking process to develop a school-wide strategy for global education a strategy that is absolutely viable even as this time, as teams of educators everywhere 
are trying to figure out what is their plan A and their plan B to bring their students back to school. And lastly, provides an example, five lessons per grade of how to do that. I'll just very quickly go over, over this protocol. Put a team in charge, have them develop a long-term vision, have them study the SDGs. What do they mean? Not in being able to name them and recognize them, but in being able to understand deeply what human capacities would be necessary to, uh, for the population of students they are responsible for to advance those goals. Develop them that framework of knowledge, skills, and dispositions, and then use that to audit what was being done. At this particular time, as education systems and schools had to reprioritize, what do they teach? Because the capacity of the delivery system is diminished. This question is no less important than it was before the pandemic. Asking the question of how do we make sure that whatever we're going to prioritize actually is aligned with the goals presented in the SDG compact. Design a prototype, decide what is going to be done, communicate that, develop an implementation plan, identify the resources to carry that out, develop a simple dashboard that can help monitor whether we're doing this, a communication strategy, build the capacity of teachers, do it evaluated, do it better the next year and the next year after that. And this simple process of improvement, if a range of schools collaborate in doing this as a network, allows every school to augment exponentially the knowledge necessary to get to that renaissance, to build Florence in education in the midst of this pandemic. I have worked with networks of teachers in many different places, in Italy, a network of teachers committed to human rights and democratic education, um, who developed their own version 2.0 of this curriculum. In the United States, with uh, networks of teachers supported by one of our main teacher uh, professional organizations, teacher unions, who developed their own version 2.0 of this curriculum. I know that this is not a heavy lift. This is absolutely within reach. And it is an empowering experience for teachers to go through, through the process of asking themselves, why are we doing this to begin with? This book, which is also an open access education resource, reminds me that this moment is an unusual moment. It is not just a global calamity that we are experiencing, but it is a moment where people are asking deep questions about the meaning that they do. This book was published in the midst of this pandemic two months ago. And over the last two months, 122,000 people have downloaded this book. Imagine 122,000 people at a moment when 10 million people have been infected and more than half a million have died are asking themselves, what does it mean to educate students to improve the world? This is what gives me hope that there are people interested in building those pathways for their students, even as we speak. And so what this book does is to offer five perspectives to transform education systems. And those perspectives, which I won't have time to explain, are cultural, psychological, professional, institutional, and political. See, a lot of the work of conveying the SDGs of curriculum work, if we think about education systems as nested systems, has been work that takes place at the classroom level, that takes as the zone for global education, the student experience, and the teacher instruction subject. And I think that if this work is going to be ultimately successful, it needs to be more than placing stickers in the door of the refrigerator. It needs to be work that transformed the entirety of the public school. It need to be, needs to be school-wide change. And this pandemic and the innovation that it is inviting to, the fact that our ordinary ways of delivering education have been disrupted and that we need to be open to creating alternative means of educating is an opportunity to expand that zone of an education fully aligned with the SDGs. So what are these perspectives, which I will only be able to name right now? One is a cultural perspective. Understand that an educational institution is part of a set of social institutions that is in continuous communication with an existing culture that can cha challenge existing cultural beliefs and over time even change them. But it's very important to be in communication. And this pandemic has strengthened the necessary communication between communities, between parents and schools, and that is an asset. That is not a problem, it's an asset. It's something that should have been happening that was not sufficiently happening. It's a good thing from the point of view of system level transformation. What is an example of that? Um, for example, the Gallup organization has asked Americans, how do they think about sustainability? Uh, should, if, if there are trade-offs between measures that uh, are environmentally sustainable versus those that create jobs, what we see is that over the last 40 years, 
the percentage of Americans who give priority, who is the majority to the environment uh, over jobs is about 60%. And there has been some flux, they are counter cyclical with uh, employment trends. In other words, when jobs are scarce, people are more likely to favor jobs over the environment, but it has remained at 60%. It's very important for anyone implementing a climate change curriculum to be very attuned to where is my community on this issue and to develop programs that bring the community along. The education system, the curriculum cannot ignore the community, cannot ignore, cannot assume that communities are tabula rasa. They have pre-existing beliefs, sometimes wrong, sometimes misguided, sometimes ill-informed, but it's very necessary to develop programs of change in a way that engages the community and educate the community for them to be ultimately successful. The second perspective is about depending on the vast repository of knowledge about how students learn and how teachers teach in designing effective education strategies. These are two recent reports synthesized by the National Research Council in the United States that summarize the science of learning for the most part underutilized in efforts to educate around the world and vastly underutilized. If we, if I, one of the things I have done, for example, in this book on climate change, I have looked at every single UN publication on the matter. And many of these publications are written on the belief that educational change is something that can be ruled by decree. That if we produce a little guide and we distribute it, schools, it's like flipping a switch, will be able to uh, adopt those recommendations in their classroom. And as, as, as well intentioned as those ideas are, this is not how school cultures evolve or change. And so that's why I think engaging universities, for example, with K through 12 systems can give us the necessary capacity to help produce that kind of change in schools because there are many more of them and they're much closer to schools than any other institution that I can imagine, including ministries of education. A third perspective is a professional perspective that is about building the mechanisms, the norms and the institutions so that expert knowledge drives practice. An institutional perspective is understanding the education system is like a set of interlocking pieces and they need to be in alignment with one another. It does no good to change the curriculum or policy statements if capacity doesn't change, if assessment systems do not change, if there aren't supportive instructional materials. And then lastly, an education system is also a political arena that brings together stakeholders who have aspirations, who have views, who have hopes for what education can do to build a good society as they understand it. And it's fundamental that education reform finds a way to build a coalition, a supportive coalition that reconciles as many of those interests as possible if it is going to be sustainable. So to conclude, I think that, and I hope this doesn't sound Pollyannish, that in the middle of this calamity that we are experiencing, we all can keep hope that at the end of this long night, the sun will rise again. And it will rise if we stay focused on a, a, a vision such as that articulated by the SDGs. The SDGs are as relevant today as they were in 2015, as they were 20 years earlier. They have the potential, just as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights drafted in the aftermath of another major calamity, they have the potential to help us build a renaissance, just like the adoption of the Declaration of Human Rights did. Schools and educators can play a pivotal role in helping students and their parents develop that hope on the basis of seeing a pathway that connects the present to that more sustainable and inclusive future. Developing simple curriculum and the means to deliver it, even as this time when we're struggling to figure out how do we keep the students engaged is as relevant and as necessary, even more so than it has ever been. This is not the time to retreat and to say, we don't even know how to keep the kids. Let's just stay focused in making sure they learn how to read. This would be an abrogation of our responsibility as leaders to build that renaissance. It would be becoming complicitous in the process of development in reverse, which is of course a possibility. To conclude in a less hopeful note, perhaps, the renaissance is not the only thing that pandemics can bring. The pandemic of 1918 helped Hitler rise to power because it caused the depression of municipal spending that excluded more and more people and that helped some of them become radicalized, join extremist right-wing groups. And I 
total unknown named Adolf Hitler began to build a coalition of those groups. And he went from being a totally marginal character in 1920 to being the elected chancellor of, of Germany. So of course, a pandemic can work as climate change, as an accelerant in many of our pre-existing structural challenges and challenges in our processes of inclusion. Whether at the end of these, there is a renaissance or the total breakdown of civilization as we know it is not written in the stars, is not a destiny that is given to us, is a function of how each and every one of us chooses to act at this moment. My invitation to all of you joining us today is that you each do what is within your power to influence the education systems you can influence so that they embrace a curriculum that help us build a renaissance, that help us build a world where everyone understands, as Terence suggested 20 centuries ago, that to be human is to be able to live so that nothing human is foreign to us. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much for that very inspiring, detailed, informative, and useful presentation, Professor. Uh, you know, I see from the Q&A that there are so many questions that have come our way. Most of them to you, Professor. I don't know whether you had time to look at that screen. There are 29, 30 questions uh, which deserve an answer. But I think the time is a little against us. And if we started answering all those questions, uh, we would creep into the time which has been given to the next panel, which is only 25 minutes. So uh, my own view is, and Marco, maybe you can confirm if this is fine, that we should skip answering all these questions and go to the next panel and allow us to finish on time because we've been working with Swiss precision and uh, we said four o'clock, uh, that's the Geneva time. We'd be at the end of your presentation and we are there. So uh, Marco, if you could take over now and start establishing the next panel because it'll be unfair to cut into their time. Thank you. Thank you, Executive Director, for the um, steering this conversation with uh, Mr. Raymer. Uh, Fernando, uh, muchas, muchas gracias. We will, we will share the links that you um, promised to us with, with everybody. Uh, we will put it in the in the website. And thank you very much for, for sharing your knowledge and your capacity with us uh, today. It's a pleasure to uh, introduce Lotta Taitinen now, who is uh, um, going to moderate a panel on the role of education in building back better in the decade of action for delivery on the sustainable development goals. Um, Lotta is the uh, chief of the division uh, for partnership and stakeholder engagement related to agenda SDGs. Um, he's a long-standing career uh, uh, diplomat. Uh, she is a friend. It's very difficult to talk in good terms of friends because uh, you are biased. Uh, but she is uh, the right hand of UNITAR in putting together the uh, learning center. Without her, without her team, uh, this won't be possible. Lotta, it's a real honor to yield to you for uh, directing the panel and for the introduction of distinguished panelists uh, today. I yield to you, Lotta. Uh, thank you so much, Marco, and uh, thank you to uh, Professor uh, for your excellent insights, uh, which actually have now served as food for thought, uh, I'm sure, for our four panelists um, who I will be giving the floor to. Uh, we have with us uh, four very dynamic uh, practitioners um, who all are uh, female. We are particularly happy to have an all-female panel uh, today. Uh, so, uh, without further ado, um, let me give the floor to Ms. Vibeke Jensen, uh, who is the Director of Peace and Sustainable Development in UNESCO's education sector. Uh, Vibeke, it would be great to hear some of your reflections on what are the main impacts of COVID-19 on the implementation of SDG 4 and the education-related targets, and how can education be part of the efforts to build back better? and accelerating the implementation of SDGs. Uh, Vibeke, Vibeke, over to you. Well, thank you so much, Lotta. Um, good morning and good afternoon from Paris. And good evening to everyone. And also thank you so much to Professor Raymer for this very, very inspiring uh, keynote speech. 
very deep, so many things to discuss. Uh, it's difficult to speak after you, sir. Um, but also thank you to UNITA for inviting UNESCO to take part in this uh, very crucial conversation on education in the context of, uh, of the SDG4 Education 2030 Agenda and the impact of COVID-19. Uh, we all know the crisis um, is unprecedented with almost overnight more than 90% of schools and educational institutions closed and 1.6 billion children and young people out of school some for many months. Overall, the longer the closure, the greater the impact and risk of children not returning to school at all. UNESCO estimates that worldwide around 20 million children and young people from early childhood to higher education are at risk of not returning as and when schools and universities reopen. The hardest hit are the poorest and the most marginalized, though already at risk of dropping out before the pandemic. And UNESCO, guided by the aim of SDG for to leave no one behind, is actively tracking the evolution of school and university closures and also the movement back to the classroom. The data shows that for now, sadly, the trend in failure to return is only growing. From the start of the crisis, UNESCO raised the alarm on the danger of inequalities increasing during school closures. Inequality in terms of access, gender, income groups, rural, urban, and among countries. Distance education worked for some children and some level of education, but many were not connected at all or had some home environments unducive to learning. And alongside the public health challenge and the risk of children not coming back to school, the huge loss of learning caused by the pandemic must also be addressed using qualitative research to better understand the impact. Where children had access to various forms of distance learning, did they learn? How much? And how well? What was the gendered impact of the confinement on children and their learning? In line with the SDG vision of reaching out to the most marginalized first, inclusion, equity, and resilience must be at the very heart of what we do next. And this crisis provides an opportunity not only to reimagine education, but to enable it to take an accelerated leap into the future. As governments begin to plan that future along, that future along the line of hybrid learning solutions, we must ensure that the most disadvantaged and vulnerable, in particular girls, do not fall into the digital divide. Massive efforts have been made to deploy a wide range of distance learning opportunities to ensure that children in remote and marginalized communities and schools also get connected and access to learning. And alongside this expansion of digital access, we also need to use more traditional ways of providing distance education through radio and TV uh, and use it more effectively. The crisis has highlighted the urgent need also to reassess the idea of quality education and how it is delivered based on the insights we have gathered. And UNESCO believes that quality education equips students with the skills for critical thinking, social emotional learning, scientific literacy, and the mindsets to act as global citizens, promoting peaceful, tolerant, and sustainable societies. All of this is essential in any attempt to build back better. Healthy patients delivered in healthy schools is also key. But the pandemic brought with also another crisis. A dramatic rise in hate speech, misinformation, and fake news, and the erosion of human rights. Some countries have taken measures in the name of safety that, to curb freedom of expression and also access to information. So as we strengthen education for the future, curricular and teaching methods also need to be revisited and starts with valuing and supporting teachers who stand at the heart of learning. And all of these skills are encapsulated in SDG target 4.7. And without strengthening delivery of this target, all other SDGs are at risk of not being achieved. What is also needed is partnership. And for this reason, UNESCO created the COVID-19 Global Education Coalition, which brings together 130 multilateral, public, and private partners to support countries in developing inclusive learning solutions. The coalition, which began by addressing the immediate challenge of school closures, 
is now forging partnerships that will help transform education delivery. What this huge next step needs is top level political leadership nationally and globally to protect and prioritize education. It needs more partnerships nationally and globally and it needs more national and international spending to protect and priority education, not less. So to end, UNESCO as lead and coordinator of the SDG4 Education 2030 agenda, uh, and to respond directly to the impact of COVID-19, we are working closely with all key education partners, be they UN, development banks, global funds, and civil society stakeholders, to mount a global campaign and prioritizing education to save our future. And this will be shared in more details on Thursday morning at another HLPF event. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Viveke, for those very insightful words and, and really for uh, stressing the need for political will to implement SDG4. Uh, I think this is absolutely critical. Let me now turn to our second panelist, uh, Ms. Pauline Rose, um, who is the Professor of International Education from Cambridge University and Director of the Research for Equitable Access um, and uh, Learning Center. Over to you, Professor. Thank you very much, and it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation. I'm going to respond in particular to the question of how can different stakeholders contribute to strengthening the role of education in our current situation and in recovery expert um, efforts, but particularly, given the stakeholder that I am, how can researchers do this? Um, and I think this follows on quite nicely from um, some of the things that Vibeka was saying. And Vibeka, I would just hope that the UNESCO coalition also includes researchers, because I think it really needs to be a very much joined up effort of evidence alongside action. And so I think now more than ever, there's a real importance for us as researchers to pro be providing timely and policy relevant evidence and that can help to inform those that are at the forefront of efforts to um, really address the great challenges that we're in. We need to remember that even before the pandemic, we had an education emergency. Around one in three um, children were not able to read and write and do the basics according to um, analysis by UNESCO and the Education for All Global Monitoring Report. This has hardly changed. So we were already in an education emergency. And as Fernando was saying, this pandemic is not just a health emergency, it is also an education emergency. So we really need to make sure that political leaders are recognizing that, not falling back on their um, commitments to funding education in the interests of health. We know that there are limited spaces, we know there are economic issues that are at stake, but that it's a priority even more than ever that education continues to get the funding it requires. And I think there's already a concern from some analysis that we've been seeing that this hasn't been happening. Um, in terms of some of the evidence that's going on, we with colleagues in Ethiopia and Rwanda are preparing phone surveys to speak with teachers, school principals and parents to really understand the extent to which learning is continuing and for whom. So again, picking up on the points that are being made, understanding and recognizing that it's likely to be the most vulnerable, the poorest, the girls, the children with disabilities who are most affected. To what extent is it really continuing across the board or not? Um, what challenges they're facing? What, teach, what support teachers and schools are getting, what information is flowing down to them, as well as what, is the, what they consider to be important for when schools reopen, to get their perspectives. With others, um, we are coordinating and collating information from not only our own phone surveys, but other surveys that are going on, um, in particular in the Global South, to make sure that we're getting an understanding across a number of different contexts, trying to make sure that we're asking some common questions that can really feed in to a, a global evidence base um, that again can help to inform things in going forward. As has been said, there's really a need to understand the extent to which education technology is reaching people or is not reaching people. Um, in our analysis in Ethiopia, we find that fewer than one in five of the poorest households have access to radio. 
and yet radio is the main medium through which primary schooling education lessons are being broadcast. Knowing that it, it, this isn't going to be a solution for many is really important for policy actors to understand and our work in conjunction with the Ministry of Education and with key donors in Ethiopia um, has helped I think to shape some of the efforts going on there, including in terms of their support through the Global Partnership for Education. There are some examples from around the world that others will probably be more familiar with than me about sort of more low tech and no tech solutions in countries that have for a long time been affected by crises um, such as in Afghanistan and, and Somalia. So really learning from these as well. There's also an importance of uh, making sure we're building a strong evidence base on the extent to which learning is being lost. We know it's inevitable that learning is going to be lost. To what extent is it being lost and for whom so that we can make sure that actions respond to this effectively. Evidence from Ghana, for example, suggests that even in more normal times, learning is lost quite dramatically over a summer break. And this is more so again for the most vulnerable. And what's also important to understand from that type of analysis is that it's possible for some groups for learning to bounce back more effectively, but for others, and in this case, for girls who are already low achieving, they have much greater challenges and barriers. So what type of things do we need to make sure are in place and planning now for what needs to happen for schools as they reopen, um, according to the different contexts and timings? There are some evidence that points to um, some things that can be done and again, that we can start planning. So in um, situations that, uh, in, in contexts where there are already large numbers of children that have been out of school, complementary basic education programs have been found to be effective. They've been found to be effective in building up basic literacy and numeracy skills over a short period of time, using an approach that can build confidence and problem solving alongside, and that can help children to re-enter effectively into a formal system. And there are examples of this again in, for example, Ghana, as well as Malawi, but also many other contexts. These types of programs are likely to be needed at a much larger scale than they currently have been. They can be done at relatively low cost. And I think there's a real need to sort of assess how this can be done. Um, my final point is that, you know, we need to be getting, as I said at the beginning, real time data and learning from it. Um, the People's Action for Learning Network, the PAL network that some of you might be familiar with, that has collected data again on basic literacy and numeracy for many years um, in, in a number of different countries, now I think at least 13 countries. The evidence from that has identified that the disadvantage for children's learning starts from the very early years. So unless we tackle that very, the early years of education, then we're never going to or well, it's going to be very difficult for those younger children to catch up. Again, this is going to be even more important in the context of COVID-19, recognising that ed tech solutions are less likely really to reach these children for a number of reasons. They're learning through play, for example, doing that through the radio or television is, is extremely difficult. So thinking in particular what building back better means for these children is going to be really important. Um, again, on a positive note, it's exciting to hear that the PAL network are launching a new tool on Thursday this, this week, the Internationally Common Assessment of Numeracy tool, which will really help us to understand um, most immediately how children are being affected and what learning, how learning is um, being affected across in a comparable way across a number of countries that they're supporting and their work very much links with the grassroots and citizen level to make sure then that change happens throughout the whole system from the grassroots through to the national and global levels. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Rose. Uh, and now, uh, without further ado, let me turn to our third panelist, uh, who is Ms. Madeleine Zuniga, who is the Vice President of the Global Campaign for Education and member of the Latin American Campaign for the Right to Education. Uh, Madame, over to you. Yeah, <laughs> here I am. Thank you very much. I would like to thank the organizers of this special event for being a panelist in this very important session. 
I feel that I'm going to repeat perhaps many things that have been already said with what with which I completely agree. But I think we have to stress, you know, if we all have the same ideas of how the, the impact of COVID-19 on education, perhaps we can make or gain more allies to start working to overcome all the crisis that is is the impact in education first of all of course i think that most of most of us have recognized that the main impact is how visible the inequities in our societies is nowadays it's not only that they are visible but they are deepening the inequalities are getting to be more profound and it will take much more time for uh, societies to work in terms of getting more giving more opportunities to everybody for a really human development. The fact that uh, the closure of schools, as we have heard, starting from nurseries to universities have caused that millions, millions of students really are, are, are losing education. They are left behind and nobody wants to be left behind. It is definitely the strategy that many governments um, assumed that was going to be the, the best, or at least the not that bad, <laughs> to, to deliver education was the remote education in emergency. But unfortunately, structural conditions like having electricity or connectivity were very bad, very limited, and sometimes non-existent in many, many places, not only rural areas, but also urban areas. This is why many children are not, are not really uh, exercising the right to education because Despite the multimodal emergency or distance uh, learning strategies, they don't have access to either internet, television, or radio. The, the poverty is a main feature that is shared by all the children and also young people and adults are left behind. There are many indigenous population, also people with uh, different disabilities are the ones that are left much more behind. Of course, women have always suffered from being marginalized and this COVID-19 is affecting a lot their lives because at home they are loaded with much more work than men, for example. And many times we have women teachers that have to take care of their children, perhaps attending a remote learning and they have to give themselves remote lessons as well. And they have the stress of keeping up the household, right? So so women, girls, and, and adults are suffering more impact, we would say, than men in this special and unprecedented and predictable situation that we are all living. And the, the great gaps of infrastructure are very difficult to close in a very short time. As overnight, Stay as schools were closed. So the sad consequence of this is that many, as we have heard, millions of students have lost learning, have lost education, practically all through 2020. And there is a great uncertainty whether they can go back to school, back to education during 2021. Concerning the, that means that inclusion in education is going to be much more difficult to achieve than it was before COVID-19. And so will be SDG 10 to demand a equal opportunities for everybody, right? So we are really facing a very crucial and essential um, target to work for. 
as the second question, I'm trying to, to answer three, the three questions. How can education be part of the effort to build back better and accelerating the implementation of the SDGs? I could say that uh, states must assume that they are the only warrantors of human rights and they must recognize that education is key to achieving sustainable development that will transform the world. To fulfill the role, states must increase investment in public education systems, design and implement intersectoral policy, social policies and strategies aimed for achieving the SDGs with a comprehensive perspective. Education will help to end poverty, malnutrition, to learn about preventive health and opens the path to decent and qualified jobs. It is definitely the best tool to fight against discrimination of all sorts and achieve gender equity at all levels. So COVID-19 is urging us to analyze school curricula and define learning priorities, learning competencies, placing ecology at the center. The uh, students of all different levels should understand what it means to be part of, to take care of the planet to start with and what it means to, to take care of our lives as part of this planet. Climate change then is all, is, has to be a real substantial part of the curriculum nowadays. It will be a challenge for educational systems for sure, but we do believe that it is a must after COVID-19. This challenge calls for a significant improvement of teacher training. Teachers from early childhood to tertiary education could be excellent promoters of sustainable development. Their training should be framed within a human rights approach, based basis for understanding the aims of 2030 agenda and the inter interdependent linkages between almost all SDGs. It is also essential that teacher training achieve optimal management of computer and communicational technologies, since they are very useful tools for teachers and students throughout life. Concerning the third questions, the different how the stakeholders can, can contribute to strengthening the role of education, we must say that the best contribution will be acting in solidarity as allies of public education. As such, they can jointly advocate for greater investment in public education, public health systems, and also for free internet access and clean water for all, at least. There are initiatives that could be identified to reinforce them and in this way prevent expansion of private education services that does not guarantee the fulfillment of the right to education. The relationships between the actors of the educational community should be strengthened. Students, teachers, families, local authorities, each of them may assume the role to pursue quality pertinent education that mean, meets local development goals, which finally will turn to be global goals. And perhaps we have the hope that in the transformation of our world will not take that long. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Thank you so much for those very insightful remarks. And now it's my uh, particular pleasure uh, to give the floor to our youth voice uh, on this panel, uh, to uh, Tasnim uh, Hemadeh, who is joining us from uh, Syria. Tasnim, you have the floor. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me well? Yes, we can. Thank you. Hey. Okay, it's a pleasure that I'm speaking in front of all of you. So thank you for giving us a voice. Uh, 
Okay, I will be starting. Uh, I just want to say first that uh, I'm deep, uh, I deeply hope you are all safe in this time of uncertainty and fear. Uh, and I will to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Tassim Hamadi, an electrical engineer from Syria, and I'm interested in sustainability and improving education, especially college level education, and uh, rebuilding Syria sustainably. It maybe seems a bit odd. This is what I face when I say I'm interested in rebuilding Syria sustainably, but I think that the cities around the world are hubs for ideas and culture and science and productivity and social development. Uh, but in Syria, they could be even be more. They could be meeting both and uh, the seed of a new economy and a way to heal from more economically, socially, and environmentally. So, so I started this. So for the past few years, I have been working on rising sustainability and sustainable rebuilding. I first I first started my work and visualized the 2030 when we shared the Act Green vision. Then my team and I were interviewed at TW, Shabab Talk with Jafar Abdul Kalim, which is a very famous show that pretty much everyone saw at that time. So it was a screen is streaming across the Middle East and uh, with the high numbers of followers come high numbers of questioning and mocking. Actually, people in general and even youth from Syria and even developing countries believe that high-tech innovation and motor solution are monopolized for some countries and that we can't should, or shouldn't do it, or at least not putting it as a priority. This is something I have been and still facing in my work. So, but now I will mention. Uh, this is some, but Tasnim, I will. Tasnim, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh, some of the start have talking about my work at, about education at, at the time of COVID-19. Yeah. Tasnim, can you hear me? Uh, if you can speak a little bit, please. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Okay, so I should speak slower. Right. So, but now, I'm... okay, so I should speak. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I will first mention uh, the impact of COVID 19 on education in Syria and what are the main impacts of COVID 19 and implement in implementation of SDG 4 and education related targets. Well, Syria, like many. Many countries uh, around the globe uh, have been quarantined with the schools dropped off earlier with no exams, so they just skipped yeah, slower. All of the kids were getting to the higher level. So advocates were publishing and raising awareness about this uh, most uh, massive online courses and uh, seeing news for the first time, taking it seriously as COVID-19 affected on all of, all of the country. And uh, in Syria, it actually helped Syrian youth to see beyond their colleges and their schools and give them, uh, the quarantine, I mean, give them time to enter enter MOOCs and, uh, to, uh, and to study in high-level university and seeing things more possible. Like, I, like I've just, just mentioned that when we actually talked about the active green vision and how we want to rebuild Syria sustainably, it was all for them old and that to clear. And but then this time when we were like talking a bit about rebuilding sustainably and policy making, it was much easier because people doing the quarantine were more open to the other parts of the world or other way to, le to, to learning and to understanding than uh, at any academic to the higher level at the time. You know, for example, at the Syrian Youth Assembly, which is an organization, Syrian organization, uh, so there is a Facebook group uh, with more than 10,000 people sharing their most certificate, which is actually great. On the other hand, looking at the school level during the quarantine, it was the first time that Syrian kids were affected by war and studying the B plan online. The B plan which is a very, it's more like, to, uh, to, like, uh, like I just, just made a program for kids who drop it off good guess of the world. Uh, for the first time, we in the same situation, kids, kids didn't drop off school. We understand that negative effect of this uh, uh, off earlier with no exams. So I think this pandemic, uh, there were kind of social cohesion between kids who were studying in school and 
and kids who were getting their education online to follow up with the schools. So I know that it seems all negative and etc. But in Syria, I have witnessed this kind of like really coaching between kids for the first time. The kids who were getting their education through WhatsApp from UNICEF, the kids who were like in, in a conflict area and they dropped off in here earlier and they are like taking extra classes through WhatsApp to, so, so, so they can follow the school for the first time. They were teaching the kids who didn't drop off school or who was in school on the time how to study online and you know i'm just i just want to turn on this because i think it was very incredible Tasneem, Tasneem, now how can it Tasneem, i hope you can be burden Tasneem. to be and yeah, yeah, I can hear. my uh, my apologies uh, <laughs> the connection is quite poor uh, and some of our uh, audience is having a hard time uh, following. Uh, what I would suggest is that uh, if you can send us your remarks and we will put them uh, online uh, so that colleagues can refer to your uh, remarks okay. there. With many, many apologies, I think these are some of the challenges that we experience in this uh, virtual uh, reality. So thank you, Tasneem, so much for your participation and for your understanding. And we do look forward to having your remarks and we will put them uh, online uh, for colleagues to refer to. So uh, Marco, let me hand the floor over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Lota, for organizing this uh, um, the panel. Uh, very insightful um, information. Um, uh, thank you very much, Tasmin, for, for uh, uh, sharing um, the information that she did. She is in a difficult spot, she is across the globe. Uh, but I, I, I uh, uh, follow your uh, lead, Lota, and all the panelists' presentations will be shared uh, either by the UNITAR website um, during the uh, Learning Center or by uh, UNDESA. So the message will go across the, uh, the board. So now it's time to uh, close in our, our event. And we have Mr. Alex Trepelkol, who is uh, officer in charge of the Division for Sustainable Development and, and Goals. He is a former director of finance for, for development. He also has been uh, a long-standing career um, civil servant on the United Nations, and is also a former diplomat from the Russian Federation. Uh, Mr. Uh, Trepelkol also is expert in macro and microeconomic issues and social policy. And he will give us some uh, closing remarks, some thoughts about the uh, panel today. Alex, it's a pleasure to see you. Thank you very much for, for your time. Apologies for the delay, and I yield to you for your closing remarks. Uh, thank you very much, Marco. Distinguished participants, dear colleagues and friends, ladies and gentlemen. We have come to the closing of this opening session entitled uh, Learning and Training for SDG Implementation in the COVID-19 Era. Today's event launches a week-long series of courses and workshops organized jointly by UNDESA and UNITAR in the context of the 2020 edition of SDG Learning, Training, and Practice Session. On behalf uh, of UNDESA, I would like to thank UNITAR and in particular my former colleagues as G. Nikhil Seth and Ambassador Marco Suazo uh, for their excellent partnerships, collabor partnership, collaboration, and flexibility in setting up uh, the program and adjusting the structure uh, to enable this year's discussion to take place virtually. I also wish to thank uh, all the speakers, uh, moderators, and panelists at today's event uh, for their insightful and inspiring presentation. Uh, let me also recognize uh, the contribution of the organizations who will be sharing their knowledge and expertise with stakeholders all over the world during the five days of the SDG learning, training, and practice. Through the open uh, uh, call circulated by DESA and UNITAR, we received almost 60 uh, training submissions from stakeholders representing different sectors and thematic expertise. The submissions were review, uh, reviewed uh, by DESA and UNITAR with a view to setting up a program that would maximize the learning opportunities in line with the theme 
of the 2020 session uh, of HLPF, namely accelerated action and transformative pathways, realizing the decade of action and delivery for sustainable development. This year's session will be delivered by representatives from some 35 organizations. The sessions and workshops will feature speakers and experts from academia, national governments, and other sectors offering practical tools and good practices that we hope can strengthen the capacities of government representatives and st stakeholders to implement the SDGs. All sessions will be webcast and uh, the materials uh, will remain publicly available on the website. Ladies and gentlemen, the complexity and integrated nature of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development demands new and stronger skills, tools, and partnership abilities. Uh, the multiple challenges brought on to us uh, by the COVID-19 pandemic have also clearly shown how central the SDGs are for building resilience against external shocks and avoiding backsliding into poverty and hunger. We all agree that the 2030 Agenda serves as a reliable compass and policy guide to recovery from the current crisis and sustainable future for all. The SDG learning training and practice sessions are an important contribution to inclusive multilateralism, facilitating exchanges and peer learning at a time when collaboration and sharing experiences is needed more than ever. We will all uh, partner together uh, in um, sharing and enriching our learning experience. Thank you. Over back to you, Mark. Thank you very much, Alex. And thank you for sharing all the programmatic that we have during the next uh, uh, week. Uh, there is also some uh, um, studies that show that having these events for a long period of time can be uh, exhausting. So I will just uh, close in saying thank you. Thank you very much for our, to our participants uh, to uh, join us today about the number about uh, 500 uh, or panelists and also for uh, the uh, sharing experience uh, that we had uh, today. Uh, this is an rich environment and we will try to keep it uh, for the next nine sessions to come. Uh, Lota, thank you very much to you for your support and for being with us all the way. And we will continue this partnership. Thank you to the uh, Assistant Secretary General to join us today. Uh, thank you very much and hopefully we'll see you soon uh, in the next days to come. Have a good, wonderful day, all of you. Bye-bye.